Someone who come up on my blaze, someone who plays. Bong, ding, go down, de bong, go dee, go down. Be my Bert and all Jeebus. Someone who doesn't have hands, someone who plans down, 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 down. Be my Bert and all Jeebus. <laughs> Why is it so dumb? Someone who they don't have hairs. Someone with hair. Sprinkle bound, de bong, ding, a bang. Mm, oh, so tasty. Be my. Hey, Drew, how's my sound check doing? Sound check. I'm a check a mic, gonna be a mic checker. Check, check a mic, gonna check a check a mic, check a mic. I'm a microphone checker. What's up, y'all? How you getting that sound? Sound if good? Sound if good? Awesome. Well, let's clean up these intros and make them. Be my... Hey, guys, what's up? It's old hankering for now. If you're looking at these, these walls, these books, these hallowed hallways, you know you're right here where you should be at Runehammer. This is Drunks and Dragons. I'm hankering for now. And uh, here... We like to play D&D &D just a little bit more better than we used to. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm back on this setup because, you know, I'm just that way. You know, I get crazy with it. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. It's Friday afternoon. And when it's Friday afternoon, that means it's time to holler at your boy right here, Ingrid Bernal. Um, hi. So we got a couple of things to cover today. The intros. <laughs> So, what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about, we're going to talk about, well, happy Friday. First of all, it's October something or other. We're in the teens now in October. That's crazy. We got dry leaves in the streets, cool breezes. It's a little darker and there's scary winds by night. The veil grows thin. Very exciting time of year. Everybody loves spooky season. Um, thanks, Kuchigari, for the beer money. Appreciate that. All right. First of all, let's just get right into it. Because I'm trying not to make these videos like two hours long. <laughs> Nobody has two hours anymore. By the way, if you want a good way to diffuse your mini painting light, I use a nut bag. It's literally the plastic bag from Mixed Nuts. That is my light diffuser right there. That is a nut bag you're seeing right there. I've been made fun of it by my significant other for having a nut bag as my miniature painting light. Anyhow... What was I saying about not making these videos too long? Hard Suit Session 10 is in the bag. It's actually a little bit ago. Um, we're on an off week this week because I'm back to my North Holds group. Here in a couple weeks, I'm going to be sitting on four groups total. So I'm going to start alternating a little more and like balancing it out so that my, my verve, my thirst for life continues to grow rather than diminish into the West. Okay, so anyway, Hard Suit Session 10. Let's just bang out these events of what happened so that you will keep up to date on this super dope little campaign in Hard Suit. Now, if you're curious about Hard Suit, you can pick up the PDF on my website. Just jump over there right now, runehammer.online. You can get it there. And if you like it and it's cool, you know, you get in on that hardback book. The hardback book is really cool, but PDF is always nice and cheap. You can check it out. But these guys are deep in the Hard Suit. They're so deep in the Hard Suit, we only have one surviving character from the original group now. Now that we're at session 10. So we got some new players come in. Now, if you watch that session nine recap, shit was brutal. We had two player deaths and my favorite NPC, sort of my NPC character also was killed in this wave of debris and chaos. And their dice were horrible that night. It was bad. But uh, what's that old saying? Uh, what would be sweet is made sweeter with toil. <laughs> so... That's what happened here. Session 10 comes around and the dice have completely flipped. They have totally changed their whole John. And everybody's like using the same dice sets, right? We're not those weird treacherous people who switch dice sets the minute they bag on you. No, this is unexplainable. But man, they got hot, y'all. They got hot. So we got two new characters coming in. We've got uh, Insu, the Wayfinder. It's kind of like the hard suit version of a ranger. Um, and then we have 
I mean, these are brand new characters, so it's hard to pull them right up to mind. Who's the other guy? Oh, yeah, Corvio. Corvio is like an assassin from the far south of Atria down in the sort of the desert jungly areas. And they have both pledged themselves to Cypher, who is this everlasting heiress. She's sort of an heir to at least part of the throne of this land. But she's also like three centuries old, but does, has a very cloudy memory about all of it, conveniently, because d d And they've com committed them, her, themselves to her. And they have this lengthy, like two-week-long role-playing session via our text thread with King Diamond. So he's the king of like one of the last free states in Atria. He doesn't really answer to anybody, but he wants to sort of th throw off the yoke, not only of tyranny in these lands, but now more so the doom that this Titan bubble bore is bringing onto their Western shore. So if you've been following hard suit, this thing is kind of like a mixture between like a giant octopus and, and Godzilla. And when it comes up onto shore, it brings with it this whole weather front. There's huge tidal surges. It actually eats away at the coastline. Countless people have lost their lives. It's actually eating a city. This is the sunken city where session nine occurred. And King Diamond decides like, you know what? Screw this little rebellion. The rebellion is postponed. We are going to like attack Bubble Boar. Just a second. Um, boop. There we go. Got rid of that. Silly user there. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, so we're in session 10 now. We have this lengthy discussion with King Diamond. They kind of don't want to do it. This to them sounds almost like a suicide mission. Like, let's get some ships and go blow up Bubble Boy. Remember, my players have just suffered two horrific character deaths. They don't want to just go right back into it and lose more characters. So they're super, they're really suspicious of all this. They don't want to do it. But I'm like, I don't do this very often as a GM. But with this idea with King Diamond as my NPC, I felt like this is going to be a dope chapter to the story. We should do this. You guys should like follow my lead. And that like never happens. I mean, almost never happens for me as a GM. I don't really do that. Like I have an idea for what could be next in the game. I, that's not my style, but this time I had to do it because it's just too dope. So went for it. They finally take the bait after all this role playing. He says he has two ships. He's got the Anchor Crest and the Finnegan's Pride. They're going to take these ships up. They have one ship they're going to send around as a decoy to draw Bubble Bar up out of the deep water where it kind of rests and it's dormant. They're going to draw it up after this decoy ship. Then they're going to have a hidden ship come around and they're going to drop a hard suit down into the depths and detonate it to blow this thing up. They're going to they're going to nuclear detonate bubble bore, which on Godzilla never works, but this isn't quite Godzilla. So there's a lot of confidence this is going to work. When hard suits detonate, they it's not really like conventional explosives or something. It's this sort of sorcery kind of dimension ripping explosion. So they're pretty sure, yeah, it is going to work. So the king's like, which ship do you want to get on? They're like, fuck it. Let's do the decoy. Let's be the crazy people. And they're like, all right, we'll give you a crew of three guys to help you. So that's six crew on this ship. And this ship has been specially equipped to endure a bunch of like punishment, get out there. So they're executing the maneuvers. Then they go and right away, they're attacked by some fishmen out on the water. And you guys have been following me on Instagram. You, you'll see this. I love attacking people on boats with fishmen. I know you've seen me do it before. I don't care. It's still freaking awesome. So they battle some fishmen, and then they see the plan is coming together, and they're moving out where they should be. Bubble Boar is starting to come up into the more shallow part of the water, and they see the king's ship, which is the actual attack ship. They're just a decoy coming around, and it slams into some kind of giant invisible barrier out in the open ocean. So right now, I am executing a classic Endor scenario here. Okay, I'm not even going to pretend that I'm being creative. This is straight up fucking Endor, y'all. All right, so that means... There's a bunch of cool shit happening in space, but you're not doing that shit. What you need to do is go down in the jungle and turn off the shield generator, okay? That's what I call, you know, your, your classic Endor operation. So between them figuring it out and their crewmates kind of helping them with an idea, and they do have a dinghy, they're like, we need to get to the source of the shield and turn it off. They do some investigation. They use cool spy glasses, and they're kind of working the ship, and they're kind of trying to get it back or right. The weather's really terrible and stuff like this. They find this little island called Pylon Island. It's on their charts. They get out closer to it. They see there are these weird stone structures that they can't quite see in the distance with some kind of sort of glowing lights on them. And they're like, well, fuck, that's got to be it because D&D. &D. So they jump in the, uh, in the dinghy and they head out there. 
Now, when they're out at this sort of temple complex, this very small uh, island with a weird little temple on it, there are these three huge stones and they're giving off like this sort of, you know, Aurora Borealis. And through various roles, as the bad guys are appearing, they figure out these things are generating this shield and this shield protects Bubble Boar. So until we can get this damn shield down, the whole plan is scrubbed. So they do that, but of course, this little temple area is defended. It has to be defended as well as operated. There are people there who are the everlasting. They want to protect Bubble Boar because they're kind of using it like a weapon. And then they have guardians. They have flame hounds. So I got these cool transparent miniatures. Um, again, you can always look at Instagram for all my cool photos. It's just kind of how we live nowadays. But that's where I posted the, the flame hounds and everything. So the flame hounds are brought out. They have a hard suit. The bad guys have a hard suit that protects the door to the inner temple, apparently where the workings of these stones are. But my characters don't care. The battle with the monsters seems like it's about to happen, and, and they feel quite overpowered, which is common for them. So they start putting all their work and their damage into these pylons, these, these stone columns that are giving off this fairy fire sort of, right? And it's not easy to shatter a stone column, but you can do it. So you work it. And this is very MacGuffin-like as far as a battle, right? You're not just focused on killing the monsters. You need to kill the thing. You need to end the encounter instead. But then the dice get hot, 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 hot. I'm telling you, smoking hot. Like five nat 20s, almost in a row hot. So they're just slaying it. And then... Cypher goes up. Okay, so they've kind of got this. They've eliminated the shield, right? They've broken these pillars, but now they have a bunch of monsters and bad guys. These everlasting warriors are a real problem. They're probably going to, you know, they look high powered and they're coming out. It's like a team of six people who are like high level adventurer enemies. So those are always hard to beat. So they're like, oh shit. They see the king out there executing his plan. They're like, all we need to do now is get the hell out of here. But we got this hard suit. We're surrounded. We can't go back the way we came because the waves are coming in so hard. And then Cypher goes up to this hard suit that's protecting the door. And she just uses this old voice. And this is like one of her prime things that her character does. But in this case, I'm like, come on, this is, you're using it too much. This is too far-fetched. This thing isn't going to obey you. And she's just like, well, yeah, but the Hadrian's voice, you know, it's from the ancient times. And that's where the suits come from. I'm like, all right, it, you're adding to the coolness of our world, so I got to at least give you a chance. Hit me with a nat 20 or nothing, and then on call, what does she roll? <laughs> Drops the 20. On call. That is the the best roll in all of role playing, is give me a 20. Okay, here. And you roll it. So now the momentum is huge. The hard suit gets out of the way. They use the interior of the temple to escape the bad guys. They slam the door. They realize they're in a complete dead end. Oh, crap. So they may have accomplished the mission, but now they're trapped in here. The bad guys are all stacking up against the door. Like, this is not good, man. There's like no way out. And this is two thirds of the way through our session. So what do they do? They do what meat and potatoes D&D &D players always do. You start searching, start looking around, see if you can find something, check all the seams in the stones and look for, there's no way that you would want a structure in this world with only one entrance. It's terribly inconvenient, even sacred structures. And, and all of us, with all of our intuitive Vitruvian architectural experience in real life, know this. A, a building with a single entrance, even like a cabin-sized building, it's annoying. <laughs> you always want two entrances. So sure enough, again, the dice just are relentless. I have to give them goodness. So they find this secret passage, but it's incredibly narrow. So as they're squeezing through this secret passage, of course, the bad guys are coming in, but they get managed to hustle out the back of this temple just in time, right as this massive explosion rocks the ocean, sweeps this huge blast wave across the island. They use the confusion to get back on their dinghy and escape. But both ships remain intact, but we do lose one crewman to the fishman battle at the beginning of the session. So we did lose. We did have a casualty. Um, and uh, my players sort of are get back to the river inlet, back to the mainland. After this massive triumph, they have slaughtered Bubble Boar. They have killed a titan. So now not only they've robbed the supreme bad guys in our world of this like sort of massive weapon that they've been using, but it's also like a fuel source. In session nine, they learned that the blood of titans is actually the stuff that like this glowing blue fuel is that like, runs these kind of like Final Fantasy style machines, right? And so by destroying a Titan, you kind of rob the bad guys of this, this super refined fuel, which is the blood of Titans. 
So now we're coming into this, this big triumphant ending and the high fiving is just off the hook. It wasn't a terribly long session. It was about just under four hours, which is pretty short for us because we had um, somebody had a, an obligation there later at night. Um, but it actually worked out really good. And just coming off of it was so great. And like I said in the beginning, like, where something would be sweet, toil makes it sweeter. And what I make, mean by that is that session nine was an absolute brutal crotch kick for this group. Like they got, they got popped in the chones, you know what I'm saying? Like they were, they were down and out. They really got beat badly. And then to come back on an equally dangerous mission, but to have the dice be the, the thing that really changed the tone it made it all the sweeter for them. And so I, I think there's a great takeaway here for, for GMs and players alike is that when you do hit these sort of these valleys and these pits of, of disorientation or of sadness, confusion, um, even feeling robbed or cheated sometimes when a character dies or multiple characters die, or maybe a story thread in your world it concludes in loss, in, in not in winning, but in actually just getting your ass handed to you. That, that when those things happen, yeah, they do hurt and they are frustrating and they can be a little scary. You don't necessarily want them to happen. But when they happen, they give a context that triumph will benefit from later. So when you do eventually triumph after a big loss like that, the, the, the nitty gritty feeling of hell yeah is really palpable in the air with the group. And so once again, you guys know that I'm a huge believer in the power of learning from failure and not being afraid of dying. And, and as our table, our mantra is, if there's no death, there is no game, right? And so I know that there's a lot of like dogpiling nowadays on which system doesn't let characters die enough and all this kind of stuff. But I think it really comes down to who's playing, who's the GM, and what do the dice do? You, no system is responsible for anything. Systems are completely dormant entities that live in books. They have zero sway over us. It's us that make these stories and these games the way that they are with the twist of the dice, especially if you roll dice out in the open all the time. So moral of the story, session 10 was a massive triumph for these guys and made all the sweeter by the brutal defeat in session nine. All right. So now we got that recap out of the way. The next recap you can look forward to will be my North Holds group. We're going to put in a big session, probably seven hours on Sunday night this week. So um, a lot of excitement happening there, but no need to cross the wires right now. Now, at the end of that recap, I kind of touched on something I want to do a, a deep think on real quick before we go to Q&A, okay? And, and that's this this feeling of, of, of games holding sway over us. And I want to, I want to call out right now. I want to call to all my people and to everyone out there on the internet and everyone in the RPG community as a whole, let this fall be the end of the age of lamentation in tabletop role playing. Let this be the end of the age of lamentation. It ends now. Now, first of all, let's get a definition on that. And I'm going to show you how no matter which side of this argument you're on, you're leading to the same place. Okay, what do I mean by the age of lamentation? I would say that since about five years ago, so about a year and a half into the existence of 5th edition D&D, the lamentations began. The lamentations are what a system, whichever one you choose, a lot of it, of, of course, is about, you know, the Hasbro D&D what a system may or may not have, what may or may not be written in the books. And I got to send a quick shout out to Matt Crow, one of my favorite people on the internet right now, for kind of stirring these chemicals in my brain this morning with his tweet. So the lamentation is, there's too much of this, too little of that. There's this cool thing, but it's not really that well reinforced. There's this thing, but it's just barely mentioned. Or there's this other thing that they completely forgot to put in there. What the fuck? Whoa, right? That's lamenting. No. All right. So in the case of Matt Crow's tweet, this very specific tweet that he put up, he said, it's a bummer how in D&D we have all these cool damage types, bludgeoning, slashing, piercing, right? And yet there's no robust follow-up for that concept. 
And he said, you know, maybe it's just because it's sort of a traditional like lingerer from previous editions and stuff. And this is kind of a bummer. So if you say this is kind of a bummer, that's lamenting, right? You're lamenting what may or may not be in a book or books or, or materials that you own or hope to own, right? That's lamenting. And I don't, I'm not like coming at Mapcro at all. I'm actually happy that he's bringing this up because I think what it's showing, it's showing me that these lamentations are sort of like losing their teeth. Now, what does that mean? I, I think that no matter which side of this sort of discussion you may fall with your personal opinion and your experience at your tables, you're going to join me in the logical inevitability of seeing that the age of lamentation is coming to an end. Okay, so let's take the counter-establishment point of view on this, which is my point of view, obviously. That's like where I live. But then let's also take the establishmentarian point of view, right? And that is someone who is firmly in the grips of good old fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, okay? That's what I would consider the establishment. It's the, the biggest one out there, right? All right, so let's take my stance first. Mine is easy. There's no need to lament anything that's written in a book because I'm counter-establishment. I, I do whatever I want. I hack my systems into whatever they need to be, especially with the collaboration of my players. We barely even have books at our table. We owe we owe ourselves to nothing. We're part of the hermetic D&D tradition. We are, we are both formless, but we are self-policing. We keep ourselves consistent and we agree upon how things bend over time. And at this point are in a game that is not recognizable as any edition of D&D or as any other RPG I'm familiar with. It's our thing. It's not willy-nilly. It doesn't change every week. We keep each other tight. But the answer for why there is no lamentation needed anymore from the anti-establishment point of view is simple and inevitable. The interesting one is this character over here. If you are in the R.A.W. school of D&D 5th edition, then you should be casting some stink eye my way right about now. You'd be saying, bro, we play correctly out of the book within an edition, within a system as it was intended to be played. I'm not just going to make shit up so that I can't lament what may or may not be in my books. I'm not going to do that. I get to lament because we do not include things that are not included. So I can lament their absence, right? That's this sort of counter argument. Let the lamentations continue. But I truly believe that with whatever is happening here with D&D, this sort of one D&D moniker that they're taking on, right? Now, as a lifetime D&D lover, I don't mind this title because this title to me sets us free of a lot of things. It's no longer 5th edition D&D. It's just the D&D with a big capital the, right? <laughs> I know words can't be capitals, but I don't care. Okay, so if we just have the D&D, if that's like where things are headed, to me, that spiritually embraces all that D&D has been or will be, honestly. That's a big ass name to put on a game that has been given edition subtitles for its entire lifetime. Now doing away with an edition subtitle to me says this is the D and D. And to me, it opens a gate to many things that you may or may not see included in what you're buying in the next few years. And what that does is frees you from lamentation. Okay. Let's get back to map crow's statement. He said, D and D has all these cool damage types. But without a Pokemon type, you know, weak to strong to system or persistent environmental hazards, these are his words, the, these damage types that seem so cool never really do anything neat in my game. Woe is me, right? Lamentation. But if we're talking about one d d if we're talking about the d d you are, in, in my mind, given license to take from all over the d d universe. Just know your sources. It's like any other form of informed knowledge. I, I acknowledge that you don't get to just make stuff up and be a home brewer. For this person over here, this character, that is not a viable answer to the end of the Age of Lamentation. The viable answer that they get is d d is now open and accepts itself and its own legacy its own past, its own present, and its own morphing future. It is not calling itself an addition anymore. 
This is huge to me. So there are numerous supplements out there that describe ways to give more teeth to damage types. Remember, to bring down to this very specific comment that Matt Crow made that I love, right? You've got iron scale crabs. They're immune to slashing damage. There you go. I think maybe one of the mistakes that's made is in a lot of monster entries, you're seeing resistances. And resistances are never easy to remember at the table. They're never easy to calculate. They get washed over all the time and forgotten. Sorry, that's just reality. But immunities always feel much more potent and much more exciting. And they've been part of the game in all kinds of different aspects over the years. All you're doing is escalating that a little bit. Now, someone in your group, if they're really hardcore RIW, they're going to be like, iron scale crabs, I know them from the monster manual, and they are not immune to slashing weapons. All the GM does is exactly what the GM is encouraged to do in numerous, numerous D&D books, including 5th edition, is to create unique instances of monsters. These are the blue-shelled crabs of Upper Sand Beach. They're slightly tougher. They have a thicker skin or a thicker shell because of the cold water here. That is canon, y'all. It is canon to do that. So, as the counter-establishmentarian, I want folks to stop lamenting what may or may not be in a book. To say that a book makes your table a certain way because of what may or may not be included in the text. Take responsibility for your table. Do your homework like in all other fields of knowledge. Know your references, bring them, self-police your consistency and get it done. Bang. On the establishment side, you can stop lamenting because you're no longer playing in 5th edition D&D. You are now playing 1 D&D. It is not an edition because it doesn't say edition on there. <laughs> I'm taking them at face value. You are now playing the tradition of Dungeons and Dragons, which has a vast lexicon that you can pick from and still feel confident that you live solidly within written material, within canonical material, which I understand the appeal to that. I'm not against that appeal. But you do stop this lamentation for what may or may not be in front of you. It's almost like I'm researching um, Greek mythology. And so I get the latest book about Greek mythology, and there's no entry in there about Hephaestus that's worthwhile. There's just a tiny little section. What's more useful for me as a researcher in this situation? To cry out to the clouds? There's no good entry on Hephaestus in this book. Da! Or, well, I'm going to have to go find a different book that has some more stuff about Hephaestus in it if I want to do a good job on this. That is why. I think that the age of lamentation, what may or may not be in front of us, should be coming to an end. And I feel comfortable saying this at this point, because if I were to say this five years ago, I think it would have been a troll move. It would have been a buzzkill, and it would have been a big pile of doo-doo. Like, fifth edition just come out, we're all psyched about it. You know, six, almost seven years now, I guess, ago. It was seven years ago. Jeez, wow, that's crazy. You know, I didn't want to be no buzzkill on that. We want to lament. We want to be critical. We want to think critically as edition players. We had just come from fourth edition. We were in like tactical detail land. And then they sprung, you know, easier to learn with advantage kind of land on us. We needed to talk it through and criti criticize it. But we've been doing that now for seven years. So I think it's time to end this lamentation and to make a call to people that play out there to be more like knowledge seekers in all other avenues of life, not just looking at this one book and crying out what may or may not be in that one book or set of books. We all must search to find the ultimate form of the knowledge that we seek. It's never just going to be in one little package in front of us. And that is a truth that we can and will embrace if we want to play D&D &D just a little bit more better than we used to. Mm. Mm. It's it just goes down so easy, it's so tasty. Mm. Little garlic butter on the mashed potatoes, <laughs> so tasty. <laughs> Little tiny bits of bacon in your mac and cheese. Oh, she's spicy. <laughs> blah, blah. Now I see a lot of spicy, exciting gherkins flying around in the in the comment section over there. 
Um, and Lugs Gaming, let's start right there. Let's go into this Q&A zone. Why is the onus on DMs and players to make 5e playable? What's the point of paying for books if we have to do all the work? <laughs> well, I mean, books don't do anything. Let's make sure we're extremely clear about that. Even the ultimate book you buy is a an inanimate object that does absolutely nothing. Let's be very clear about that. We do everything. The idea that books can be ascribed a doing of things is, that's that's scary to think about. That's like some page master shit, okay? <laughs> books don't do things. So why do we pay for these books if we're expected to be creative and like make everything sing at our table? I hate to tell you, Lugs, but that's the deal. That is the hobby. The hobby is us doing everything. Now, we do have help, and it comes in the forms of books. And we do have help with systems. Not everybody is just a straight up, like, from the gate game designer. We all still stick to the classic, not all, but a lot of us stick to the classic six stats. They've really stuck with us. But we are the ones who do everything. We create everything. Books just sit there. So... I think it's a great question you ask, Lugs. Why do you spend money on those books? That is a very introspective and important question to be asking. You ask a damn good question. My answer would be you don't need to. Most of us, especially if you're watching this channel, have a completely innate ability to comprehend, run, create, and play RPGs, D&D. But the books are fun to buy. <laughs> and there's your answer. So remember, put um, all caps question. And that way I can see, because there's a lot of spice in the comments today. Y'all guys are all like, woo, you switched on. Everybody had their pumpkin spice lattes. <laughs> oh, yes. Two pumps, baby. Or no, the new, the, that's old school. The new one is uh, the pumpkin cream cold brew. Welcome to 2022, bitches. There's a bunch of horrible stuff happening in the world but I can have a pumpkin cream cold brew. <laughs> That's how our priorities as a civilization, as a planetary civilization are a little sketchy sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, I'll never understand all the hate for pumpkin spice. Makes no sense to me. Shit's delicious. It's timely. It's seasonal. It's festive. It's tasty. And it's orange. Don't hate. Mm, good old bean water. Yeah, so if you guys got... Some heavy questions. You were really trucking there for a second, especially any time that like addition talk comes up. I know that hobbyists just, it's like a dog with a bone, you know? Um, additions somehow call to a very deep part of us. It, it creates loyalty. It creates argumentativeness. It creates like last stand mentalities over, you know, what the best, it, it's a very highly opinion charged area to talk about. But I'm taking what's happening at face value. They want to call it one D&D, the D&D &D stuff. That's what they could have called it. I mean, good thing I don't work there because it's a terrible title. But the D&D &D stuff, if you take that as what you're playing, yeah. What do you guys play at your table? Oh, th all that D&D &D stuff. If that's true, the lexicon you have to draw from is vastly larger than to pin yourself on an addition. How much prep do you do for high-level NPCs, Perkins asks. Um, no more than the normal. I mean, definitely you want more environmental hazards, uh, if we're talking about combat preparation and I definitely want like forced mobility, like areas where you can't stand and survive. Um, but I try to avoid hyper complex enemies because I find that in prep, they're cool. But when I get to the table, I panic and I only do half their things. Um, but how much prep? I mean, my entire life is prep. So I, I see a lot of, uh, comments on the internet about people saying, oh, wow, you you took an hour to do prep for your game? What a noob. Whoa, that's forever. I never put in that much time doing prep. I don't know what they're talking about. I think about it all day, every single day. All night, I'm working in my journal. I'm constantly thinking about ideas that can make something a little cooler. And I have attention surplus. So I jump all over from thing to thing. I get a lot of things done throughout the week, but I am constantly in a prep phase. So how much? All of it. <laughs> all my time <laughs> question i haven't heard you talk about uh magic and hard suit yeah yeah 
Um, the Magic in Hard Suit from E. That's a tiny username. How did you get that? Um, it's just called Sorcery. It's cast with a con roll because it comes from the gut, almost like the Force in Star Wars. And it's got a, you know, a list of sorcery powers. And they kind of are learned through intuition. They're not really class locked per se, but obviously certain classes are going to be more, you know, uh, prone to use sorcery. But my worlds are not magic heavy worlds. I like a little bit of magic, but I'm not one, a, like a wizard focused um, author, creator, game master. Do you still use Monster AI? I do in, in simpler and simpler forms. I really love Free League and the way they do D6 actions on all their monsters. It's brilliant. It takes a lot of pressure off the, the game master. It's the monster's turn. You're just rolling D6, maybe rolling D6 twice when it has two actions, which most monsters should, I'm convinced of now. Um, rolling D6 twice and just do those two things. So that's kind of the, the AI that I've settled down on too. I'll use have four options and I'll D4 it. That way, if it's doing repetitions that are really cruel, it's not my fault. It's the, it's the dice's fault. Um, floating point. I don't understand the negative infinity, positive infinity, that just break the laws. Of, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Is that like when you point a camera at the, at the TV? Logos, what's up? Going back to having a near TPK. Yeah. How do you treat introducing new characters quickly in a way that isn't too obvious? That text thread, yo. The, the, the running text thread between table sessions needs to be robust and active, I think, to get the depth of context that maybe you're looking for here, Logos. Um, that text thread, with our group, it's, I mean, it's huge. It's endless. It, it's massive. It's in, it even includes, like, actual dialogue, people talking in character, asking questions, even occasionally making a role and, like, filming it and stuff. Like, that. it's a hobby, right? And so I don't think you can expect context to be deep, especially something like a new character, without a lot of ancillary effort by GM and player alike. I hope that uh, answers what you meant. Um, yo, CB, what up? How long did it take you to come come up with juicy loot tables and hard suit? Oh man, thank you. Those were brutal. Doing 100 item loot tables is exquisitely difficult. And I find it terribly disappointing that so many books, oh, I'm doing it. I'm lamenting, I'm lamenting. <laughs> I'm lamenting that more books don't have D100 loot tables when my books have them. See how silly it is to lament? Or I could sit down and make one. But uh, how do I do them? Just patience and time, man. Patience and time. Know your mechanics and let yourself be loose and be a little silly and just have fun with it and let, let yourself take time with it. It takes a long time to do those damn things, like a matter of weeks to do one table. Um, just to make it have a lot of diversity and fun. But damn it, if I don't love calling for a D100 loot roll, so, you know, roll on seafaring loot, roll a D100 for me. It's like maybe one of my favorite things in all of role playing. Um, yeah, Patosh, that's a cool name. Yo, Patosh, what's up? Have you said that you were thinking about circle method? Um, or will there be a sequel? I don't know how to properly use it. Oh, well, it's hard to go wrong because you kind of just wing it, but yeah, I could do another video on circle method. I use it a lot. I also don't always use circles, I draw all kinds of weird shit and use basically methods in my journal to kick my my brain in the side of the head and get out of my old habits that's why you use pneumatic or pneumatic <laughs> mnemonic devices like circle method just to break your habits all right kuchigari's up in here i'm trying to design my uh, world map around my old campaign yep so you can play in the same world fuck yeah do that that's a great thing to do do you have any method for laying out your point your point of interest that you have in your head no no, let yourself flow. Do a little bit of this part of the map. Do a little bit of that part of the map. Let yourself flow around so it doesn't become a chore. Remember, keep it fun. Let yourself be loose. Just have a good time with it. Don't worry about the point of interest. That's a player problem, not your problem. There is no point of interest. Worlds are just worlds. I mean, unless you have like a big black castle in the center, like Dark Crystal or something, then draw that first, I guess. Stick it in the middle and work from there. Word up, logos. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got my hubs and my, yeah, I mean, just get the things that you know you need and just kind of stick them in there. Just let yourself finger paint, you know, just stick them in there and see where it goes and, and go from there. Uh, how would you deal with anxiety when GMing? Huh, I've got it every time, two hours before a session, I realize I have no clue what the fuck I'm doing. And I've been doing this for over 30 years. And how do I deal with it? I usually just have a beer. 
I almost always will go get a cold glass of beer before I go to um, my friend's house where we play by myself. You get a beer, knock it back, whew, get my case over my shoulder and head out. And that uh, that's just me. That just helps me. I know that's not good for everybody. Um, but yeah, GM anxiety is absolutely real. And as one of my mentors told me long ago, if you're not nervous, you're not trying. So you should be nervous. It's good. But how do you keep it from becoming anxiety? You know, that's up to each one of us. Use your vices. Use things that make you feel good. Don't use them to such extremes that you can dissolve into madness, of course. But a little bit of self-treat before DMing can be a very good thing. Um, lament. Why doesn't every system include GM device and how to invade, how to engage with BC's archetype? Uh, because it's not demanded, maybe? Yeah, bullet points, tropes, and themes that'll be satisfying is helpful. Yeah, I mean, not all books are created equal. Some of them help us more or inspire us more. But I think it's silly to lament that the things we like aren't just everywhere. Like I was about to do with the loot tables. Why aren't the things I like everywhere? Who says that? <laughs> you know, like, why isn't like, you know, the cheeseburger joint that I like in every single city in America? <laughs> I'll tell you why, because you're in reality, bro. All right. Um, I hope that answers, though. Jade, Jade's Tabletop Tavern, what up? Uh, how much planning is too much? No such thing. Although I only plan one session at a time. Because planning beyond the session robs the players of their agency, robs them of control, robs them of real choice. You can only plan one session, one blob at a time. Then you need a profound and important player choice. Um, yeah, don't railroad players. Things can be linear. That doesn't make them railroading. Railroading is a negative term. Um, my, my homie, Alex, uh, he is a somewhat linear GM. His, his stories have a water slide effect to them, but that doesn't mean it's railroading. Railroading is an uncomfortable and negative thing, but having parts of your story or your adventure that are the linear is completely fine. Many of the greatest stories ever told have linear elements. So how much planning is too much enough to make you feel like you're having fun and that your players are having a good time, but that there's real choice for players. And that's what you want. And you can plan for that too. But like I said, I spend every hour of my waking life basically thinking about D&D. &D. And I feel like I run great games. So I don't think that's too much planning. <laughs> and as for your final thing there, Jade, uh, how do you develop plot hooks? You got to verb the noun, man. Verb the noun. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just funning on uh, the new video from Dungeon Dudes where they talk about writing adventure hooks. Um, it was also funny because the title of their video is... Uh, Writing adventure hooks that are compatible with D&D 5e. <laughs> like, aren't adventure hooks compatible with absolutely anything? But anyways, their solution was verb the noun. So find yourself an exciting verb like steal and a cool noun like sword and steal the sword. And there's like the beginning of a start of a hook. And simplicity is king. So go watch their video. They get all into it. It's pretty much how I do it. I think hooks really should be tiny and should play into your players. You know your players. Use their psychology. Use their tastes. And, and draw them in with something that's fun and exciting for them. It's, it's not rocket science. I think it's just be direct. Listen to your creative voice when it speaks. Write it down and don't overcomplicate it. Yo, Og Bang, what up? Did you say at one point uh, that you roll during a session for NPCs? I do, especially in hard suit. There's a, a D100 table of random people to meet, each one with a sign of a personality foible and a name, so that when you're on the spot in the session, you can just pop a person up and kind of go with it. Um, a lot of books have had that over the years. Um, and then just wing it. Yeah. I find that I'm not good at planning and being ready for all the NPCs that pop up in a session. So I, I need a little bit of help in that area. Um, I'm really, my specialty is like emotional gravity, you know, really dynamic combat and, and big sweeping stories that are driven by characters. The specifics of NPCs is an area I constantly, um, you know, have room to grow. Yo, Miku, Miku Doodles, what's up, dude? I love your drawing videos. Right on, thanks, man. I always watch them when I need some drawing motivation. That's cool. I will make more drawing with Hank videos. It seems that uh, my equipment is happier nowadays doing some tests so I can hopefully do a screen share 
um, and do some more art stuff. I love doing that stuff. I'm right in the middle of a, a pretty big art project right now. So, well, I mean, I always am. That's what I do for a living. <laughs> but yeah, I'll definitely do that. How do you let go and not become a jaded woman hater after a divorce? Wow, John Hurst. Well, first of all, you got to look deep inside your soul and don't hate people. I mean, I guess there's an extremely small number of people in this world that might be worthy of your hatred uh, because of their egregious crimes against humanity. But uh, generally, hatred is just going to burn you up. It, it doesn't get you anywhere. You got to embrace love, man. You got to embrace forgiveness. But how do you do that? Pff, fuck if I know. But I, I don't really have a lot of hate in my heart. I I can see how people get to the situations they get to. But, uh, you know, everybody's different, especially with that sensitive situation. You just, you can't let hate come into your heart. Just don't do it. It's a waste of time and energy. Don't fuck with it. <laughs> Find people that fan your flames, as, as the immortal Will Smith said. <laughs> get around people who make you feel good. And another, uh, maybe a pro tip with all this kind of stuff is like, make change happen in your life. Move. Move to a different area. Meet new people. Change your habits. Get new clothes. Become a new person. And it's a good way to find new love and new excitement in life rather than dwelling on old things that are gone that you can't change. I hope that answered an extremely difficult question. And good luck to you, sir. Uh, Godspeed as well. <laughs> okay, Lugs is back. Which system do you think runs Dark Sun the best? Uh, all of them. Any system can run Dark Sun awesome. Dark Sun is a thematic environment, not a mechanical environment. Um, if it were me, I would do like I do with our, every game. I, I sit down with players before we're doing anything. We discuss options for what would feel fun. And we do some sort of test rolls and we screw around a little bit and we we go from there. We usually pick a foundational system, but we do it based on discussion. I'd, yeah, I, I don't think anything would be best for any theme. It's just what you're good at, what your table accepts, what your style is like, what kind of dice you guys roll, you know. No system is good at anything. Um, where are we at? Logos is back. Been planning graveyard campaign. I don't know what that means. Any ideas about mechanics for necromancy-themed encounter? Well, obviously, you want lots of the dead rising. You usually want a MacGuffin uh, of some kind, which is the thing that is allowing the dead to rise. And until that thing is destroyed or nullified, the dead will continue to endlessly enter the encounter. That's always a fun one. So you need to go blow up the necro crystal. And once the necro crystal is destroyed, the, the dead won't rise anymore in that immediate area. That's a classic. Um, another classic is like where a necromantic enemy dies. They create a pool of like necromantic energy that's like mega draining and deadly, forcing players to keep moving during the battle. There's, there's a zillion ideas that could be played out in that. Um, zooming all the way down here to Coochie. Oh, whoa. I don't think that's a nickname you want. <laughs> Kuchigari. Do you plan to do a one shot or a campaign with Easy D6? Um, not at the moment. I am so deeply invested in all the stuff that I'm doing. I'm kind of excited to go and play Easy D6 with Scotty a little bit uh, down in Charlotte, uh, November 11th at Jeff Con. Um, but no, not right now. I don't have plans. Um, we're still working on his follow-up book, which is all uh, like 18 different adventures in one book. And that's proving to be a, a difficult writing challenge. So we're just working on it. Th these things take time. What can I say? Yeah, Philip Dudley's right. Just be comfortable in your own system. We, you know, a lot of us know what Dark Sun is like and the fundamentals of Dark Sun. You got psionics, you got like muscle bound dwarven slave dudes. You got three cream. You've got no normal magic. You've got no, um, no gods. Um, and then you've got no metal. So you have this horn, wooden sand world. And then you have these kind of uh, mysterious dragon kings who are kind of coming back, but they're kind of mummified or some kind of weird shit. Even right there, you could stop and you would have most of what you need. Just these thematic key elements and then just use whatever mechanics you're good at. Have you play tested Idols of Torment? No, I haven't. Um, yeah, Perkins is describing the new war game by uh, Black Magic Craft, which I did the conceptual design for all the miniatures in that game. Um, so that was really fun. But no, I haven't gotten a set yet and haven't, haven't played it. Get around to that. Got to put that on the list for sure. 
Yeah, yeah, necromaguffin. And then once you've got your necromaguffin, that can also be a wellspring of story or a, a sort of a font of details. So because of these necro crystals, animals in the forest are are turning up, you know, mutated and more monster like. Because of these crystals, big cracks are opening up in the ground, like in Sword of Truth, you know, and like these are access points to dungeons or subterranean caverns. Because of these crystals, the two kingdoms that used to be friends are now fighting each other because they're trying to get the one big crystal, and one of the kings is evil and fucked up, and the other king is being really cool about it, and there's a big conflict going. Because of these crystals, sea levels have descended greatly, and so ships are all run aground, but a, a new sort of breed of smaller, lighter ship is moving around, and the coastlines have changed, and on and on and on and on and on. Zelda is always really good at this. They take one core per one core cause core MacGuffin, and it spreads to everything in the world, like why the architecture looks the way that it does, why the monsters are there, why the monsters regenerate, why the monsters are different, where they come from, why there are giant robot things, like all these things come back to the same reason in Hyrule. And it's always the abstract form of Ganon in some way, making things infused with what in your world will be necromantic energy. I did it. I did it. <laughs> I did it in under an hour. I did the recap. I did the deep think, and I answered a bunch of questions because I'm on the YouTube. And my name's Hank Fernale. <laughs> oh, yeah, it sure is. Old Ingrid Burnall, they called him. Old painter. He used to be a fisherman up in Burnall Village, his ancestral homeland. But he's been driven from that place, a conscript in Henrik's army. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I just went into a complete vapor lock there on my character, Ingrid Bernal. <laughs> Yo, Philip Dudley, how are you doing, bro? This dude right here? How is this dude doing? I'm doing all right. I, I had hit a little bit of a low patch there in, uh, uh, what, late September or so, and I had to I had to call out to my shield wall and, and ask folks to up a little bit and stuff like this, uh, you know, these economic challenges of our day because of various situations that we're not here to talk about on YouTube is definitely challenging for everybody. Um, everything is tough for many complex reasons involving the scale of our planetary civilization. <laughs> so um, for a minute there, I was kind of freaking out. I was like, can I keep going? But I just had to upgrade everything and it's had a great effect. So like uh, this is the new Runehammer t-shirt if you hadn't noticed already. So you can go over to runehammer.online and get one. The blanks on these are so cozy in quality. And thanks to Kelsey at the Arcane Library, finally have a really good quality t-shirt vendor. And so these are really, really nice. And then also, I was so inspired by the Highlung t-shirt that I, I applied some of the tricks that they did. This is vastly over-resolution with this ultra micro line stroke on here that is like less than a pixel and stuff, but the print is quality, so it really holds. Anyway, there's a lot of little goodies and a lot more to come. And you can also buy PDFs directly from me on my new online shop, which may sound just like a complete dork plug, but that's a big deal, man. I put figuring that out. I put that off for years. So I'm finally able to sell things directly. And my new adventure that's coming out, I'm writing a big, like what some would call a very complete adventure for index card RPG is coming out. It's called the last voyage of Finnegan's pride. And, um, that is only going to be available direct buy from my store. So it's the first thing I've done that's direct only rather than leaning on drive through all the time. So here's hoping that this new era is, is good for a rune hammer, good for my little fam and, uh, and us keeping the lights on getting dog food. Cause Lord knows it's not cheap turning dog food into poop. It is a factory operation. We run here at rune hammer. <laughs> you got to turn, you got to take income and convert it into dog poop. That does it's top priority stuff. Yes, and I'm shipping all over the world as well. Um, as far as the last voyage of Finnegan's Pride, um, for Mono's question, uh, those of you who are familiar with the last flight of the Red Sword, obviously the titles are similar for a reason. This is a fantasy version of Last Flight of the Red Sword, but with a lot of new elements to it, like a little town to screw around with a kind of a destination point rather than just an explosion like at the end of Red Sword. and uh, But capturing a lot of the magic of what made Red Sword such a great introductory adventure. Uh, adventure. 
for players, but also with full color art, with all the maps, you know, a lot of stuff that I don't always include because I like my readers to be creating all that stuff. That's the fun of the hobby, but I've also never done this. So I want to stretch some muscles and, and get into this kind of, this kind of complete adventure creation. Uh, and as for running Red Sword and tips, just don't worry about mercy. You know, play it with 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 gnarly uh, openness, transparency with your players. Like that behemoth thing is extremely dangerous, and the pulses of cosmic energy that are hitting the ship are extremely dangerous. And letting it be dangerous and keeping those dice in the open is what makes that adventure so fun. Um, I have not seen the. Gypsum Crystal Cavern in Mexico. I have not seen that. And hey, oops, I, I drank it all. Kuchigari, I am definitely coming to Europe. Um, it's a matter of when it feels uh, in good taste and, and, and practical and convenient and, and happy for everyone to come to Europe and to zoom around a little bit. Um, so I think uh, world events could stand to... to uh, to be soothed a bit. Um, but I definitely am going to do a bit of a jaunt around Europe to try to see everybody because it's just the momentum is just too much. <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of, uh, of the Rune Hamarians are, are in Europe too. So there's a ton of people to visit um, once I get out there. But for this year, it's meeting up everyone at JeffCon. Uh, November 11th, that's in Charlotte. Uh, and then I'll be at Fan Expo in San Francisco on Thanksgiving weekend. And then I will be at PAX Unplugged right here in the great city of Philly, PA on December 4th. So at any one of those, you can come drink beer with me and we'll play a game of mugs on the side or something. Uh, what's the Inzy of the Runehammer Journal look like? Is it just lines? Yeah, it's, it's relatively conventional journal paper. It's actually a, a little thicker than like a moleskin, which I found surprising. And that's a very happy surprise. But we all love spiral bound for laying flat and stuff. So, um, yeah, get one. And they're cheap as hell. Hey. And I think that that is about it, man. About it. Yeah, Vroma, uh, the, the lead singer from Ram Jam is, yes, looks just like me. Uh, I'm sent that picture about once per month. <laughs> to be totally honest. <laughs> so that's pretty funny. Yo, my man Kriba's up in here. This guy need, deserves some love, y'all. But uh, yo, that's it. I'm done. That was an hour. And uh, there's the session recap. Y'all know what I'm up to. Um, be sure to jump over to the website too and get my blog. I haven't figured out how to automatically alert everyone when a new blog comes up. I write them about once a week. And I'm really having fun with those. Those are cool. Um, but until I figure that out, you just got to stop into the website uh, on the weekly or so and check out what's up. And um, yeah, and I, I know about RSS feeds and stuff, and that's all great. I just need help with that stuff. I don't know how to do that stuff. I haven't figured it out yet. Um, I would love to figure that out. It's just a matter of sitting down and doing it. Today I'm doing, well, yeah, with four groups now on my plate. I'm bouncing between all those and then little publishing projects and some commission projects. So I, I bounce around a lot, but I'm feeling some, uh, some mappy vibes in me for Friday night. Um, so that's probably what I'll be doing tonight. As, as usual, keep an eye out on Instagram. And really, if you want to just holler at me day by day, Discord, the Runehammer Discord is where I'm always getting pings from there and always trying to stay alert to what's going on there. So there's a lot of ways to get in touch with me. If you've got something going on or if you just want to see what my table is looking like these days, because I'm crafting everything, I'm back to doing miniatures, I'm back to making terrain, just jump on Instagram. That's where I post all my table photos, um, usually as stories, too. So they kind of come and go day by day. Um, but in time, I'm going to have a shitload of dope table photos and we'll build some more of those great montages like I used to do right here on YouTube, because I love making terrain and making tables fully 3D. It's a freaking blast. Um, I think that's about it, y'all. You know the stuff about me right now. Now, remember, if you need some moat, you need some moat deets or something, need some help with something, or you have some help for me to how to get my blog to automatically alert everybody because, like, yo, yo, I need help on many fronts. <laughs> then just hit me up. I'm hankering.fernale at gmail.com. 
runehammer.online is my site. Go peep that shit. Happy Friday, you guys. Have a great freaking weekend. Remember the golden rule. Do something nice for somebody out there. In the next few days, maybe early next week on Monday when everyone's cranky, do a little nice, you know, give somebody a little huggins. You know, get a little, little, little smoochies. Mm. No, hey, you're great. I appreciate you. It'll make their day. It'll make this world a better place. Peace, you guys. Strength, honor, and beer. And a special shout out to my man, Ned. That was super badass hanging out with you too. Until next time. All right, you guys. I'm out. Keep it real. Mila Kunis. Clint Howard. Ian Holmes.